with actually uh, our own introductions, so I won't um, go into length with introducing us, but um, I guess I'll start by saying those who read only the title are in for more than just the cybersecurity, are you at risk, just so you know. Um, that was the initial sort of kernel of the idea, and I will talk a little bit about the risk calculations that go into cybersecurity, um, but most of it, I think, the most useful stuff that I have found at um, conferences is the stuff that just says, you're someone in front of me who wouldn't normally be in the same room for whatever reasons we're here today and what can we kind of give and what can you get? And we wanna leave plenty of time for questions as well. So we're gonna start out by just going through each of sort of what we do because we all come at tech and cyber from a different angle. So you'll have a better sense of what we can answer questions about and also um, we want to inject a little bit of uh, wisdom of something I wish I had known six months ago or 10 years ago or whatever the case may be. So we'll start off with Deborah Lathan. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Okay, yes. good. Um, I didn't start off in technology at all. And in fact, it wasn't even on the uh, agenda for me. It was something that I thought of that you know people smarter than I did and, you know, people who had no sense of fashion did. Um, and, I, I, and I learned, you know, differently that there are some people who have a sense of fashion that are in tech. But, <laughs> but on a more serious note, I am, what brings me to where I am is really where I came from. And I am a child of the civil rights movement. I was at the cusp of seeing civil rights come into to being. You know, I was born at a time where the fight, the, the, I was too young to be marching in the streets, but old enough to know what was going on and to learn that I was a beneficiary of it. And so I went to law school, and I had always wanted to be a lawyer, and the driving force behind that was seeing the power of law and the power that law has to change people's lives. That's, that's, that's what drove me uh, to law school. And that's sort of the, the kernel of sort of the beginning of my pursuit in my career. And. Uh, then when I was in law school, I had a professor who was a judge here now, um, um, Harry Edwards, who said, well, you know, because I really became interested in labor law and I became interested in corporate law. And I sort of felt like, well, I can't change because I, I, I'm going to be Thurgood Marshall. I, you know, how can I do this? And Harry Edwards said to me, Deborah, the civil rights movement was about anybody being able to do whatever it is they want to do. If you want to be a labor lawyer, be a labor lawyer. You're not betraying the cause. In fact, you're furthering it. And so I practiced uh, in law firms for a long time, and I practiced in corporations for a long time. And uh, then I was in my 40s, two years ago, just joking. I was in my <laughs> 40s, and my drive for civil rights came back. That passion, and I can't live my life without having done something in that direction. And I called a friend of mine who worked uh, in the federal government, and I said, would you please send my resume over to uh, DOJ? I'd like to be in the Civil Rights Division. At that time, I was in California working for Nissan Motor Corporation, and I had done um, all kinds of uh, acquisitions and mergers, and I'd gone to Tokyo, and I'd really sort of lived the corporate life that I had never actually planned on living. And my friend wrote me back and said, I got a job for you at the FCC. And I said, that's not civil rights. And he said, oh, yes, it is. He said to me, he was the chairman of the FCC at the time, that the civil rights movement will now be fought on who has access to the information superhighway. It will not be fought on the streets. It will be fought on the internet. Those who can get on the information um, superhighway and those who don't, don't. And so if you have a driving passion to do something that matters, please come here. And that's how I ended up at the FCC. And I worked, uh, I was chief of the media bureau, which is the cable services bureau, at a time when internet, the internet was just beginning to roll out in broadband. And it was my privilege and my pleasure to have worked on some of the uh, seminal rulemakings that created the internet as it is today. So that's my introduction. And one thing you wish you had known. 
One thing I wish I'd known. Um, Drop some wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, and not just for tech, I think that one thing I would wish I'd known, I guess, is to make certain that you take a broad look at things, like there are many things that we can do in life, not just the one thing that I dreamt of as, as, when I was a little girl. And I wish I had known really how technical the world had become, because I spent a lot of time, I spent some time with the engineers at the FCC. I would have spent more time, because these were brilliant people, with the engineers really learning the nuts and bolts of technology if, if I had known that we were becoming such a digital world. Um, my name is Merritt Bear, and I um, run a consulting company where I advise young emerging tech, and I also advise the government in DHS in um, cybersecurity and communications, which is in um, the headquarters of Homeland Security. Um, and I got there always having fallen, well, having fallen in love with internet, especially in law school. Um, but always having this conviction that there was a need for this work, but not an established career path. So as with many people you all talk to, it's sort of a process of bouncing from one thing to the next and following the leads. Um, and to some extent, like reassuring your mother that you're not crazy and not unemployed just because you're you know, carving out some ground. Um, and I think that because it's a nascent professional field, that is, it's still true today that you may be the first person in the company or in the organization to be doing the kind of work that you're doing. Um, so I uh, went to law school. I was at Harvard for undergrad in law school and got into internet there in part because there were a bunch of people who didn't think like other lawyers. It was like, what what can we do? What Where are the limits? What breaks? What's dangerous about this type of action versus that? Where do the power constructs lie? And those are still things that fascinate me. Um, so I ended up coming to DC and have been there for five years. I worked initially for the military appellate court. Um, and then strung together a lot of sort of self-engineered positions. And there were certainly periods of time where I had my student loans in deferral and felt crazy. Um, but now I feel like it's been a um, rewarding process in the sense that I get to engage with the stuff that I thought was just going to be a fun hobby at first because it was just too interesting. Um, so I'm glad to answer questions on um, you know, working in government and also on starting your own shop. Um, a year ago, when I was speaking at this conference, when it was at Under Armour headquarters, I had written an op-ed on, like, don't bake brownies for work. So I'm um, just saying uh, some of the small things that you can do to sort of indicate professional um, cues that I think women sometimes don't realize that they're giving off um, cues that their time is somehow worth less or that they are... Um, you know, the office manager and not just the engineer or whatever. So I'm also glad to field, I think all of us, I'm just gonna open the field a little bit to things that, um, questions about working in and out of government, questions about role of government in tech, questions about um, how to approach someone for your next raise, all those kind of like inter um, plays, we welcome questions. And my small piece of advice would be to never accept a first offer. Even if it's coming from the government, there are things you can negotiate. I didn't really know this when, I, I don't know how I didn't know this really in retrospect, but coming out of law school, I initially accepted the first offer, which was at a consulting company, ended up deciding not to take it and to stay in DC. But in retrospect, I think when I accepted on the phone and they had said 75K and I said, okay, they said, really? I mean, great. And in that moment, I was like, oh, there was room. There was room and I didn't take it. And really, it's your career to fight for. It's your money to fight for. And I think certainly the wage gap is a real phenomenon across lots of industries. But to some extent, in your individual cases, you can fight to erase some of that distinction by just asking and making sure that you, some, some articles say like, ask for days off. If that's what matters to you, fine. To me, it was like, I want to see the money. I've now learned to be a lot more assertive about what 
I'm willing to accept. And frankly, I've never heard of a company taking back an offer. The worst they can say is, no, we can't do that. And they often try to come with other things in mind. So that would be my one piece is just never accept a first offer. All right, Gabby. <laughs> so uh, my name is Gabby Zuccarelli. I am an intellectual property litigator. Um, primarily I do patent litigation, but spoiler alert, I don't have a tech degree, um, which has, you know, I thought was going to be a big problem for me coming into this career, um, but it's actually made me quite valuable, um, and it's made me appreciate and love the technology that much more. Um, you know, I started my path, I am the product of parents who are entrepreneurs, um, immigrant op- entrepreneurs, and for me, I always saw the hustle and the struggle that comes with having your own company. And I think that ended up translating into my love of startups and technology. You see a lot of similarities there. And when I was in college, I helped one of my best buddies with a startup. Um, you know, it was something very tiny, but they had high energy. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to serve tech clients. There's something here, a dynamic that I crave and I want to be a part of. So I went to law school in Silicon Valley. And um, I ended up working in-house at a couple tech companies. Uh, I clerked for a federal judge there. And then I found my way into patent law, which is actually not as boring as people think. (laughs) Um, You know, I am very fortunate. I do mostly hardware and software work. Um, So, you know, tech comes in. We get to dissect the patent, look at all the prior art, get a sense of, you know, where, how far have we come. It really puts it into perspective. Um, And then there's the legal side of things. So um, for me, As a woman in a primarily male-dominated, you know, industry, um, and also as someone without a tech degree, it's been a bit of a struggle, um, but a beautiful struggle, because it confirms for you that this is, in fact, what you want to do, and you have to fight so hard to have it. Um, When I walked into my law school counselor's office, and I handed her my resume, I was so excited. I was like, take a look, like, you think I could get, you know, a job in IP, intellectual property, and she looks at it. She gives me kind of the side eye. She goes... Or, <laughs> and I was like, or what? And she goes, well, you know, you were in student government. You seem to be really you know, proactive and all of that. How about a government job? And I was like, that's great, but I like IP. Can we talk about IP? She had no advice for me. And in that moment, I was pretty, I was pretty mad. Um, I remember storming out of the office. She didn't have anything. I mean, really, she didn't even give me like a baby try this. So I went online, and I should have been studying, but I instead started looking at all the tech companies in Silicon Valley, and I just started sending resumes, sending resumes for a summer job. I end up getting called back um, by a company called Plantronics. They make headsets down in Santa Cruz. They're like, hey, we liked your resume. Come on in. I was like, wait, me? OK. Um, so I remember you know, going in, and I really I look at that as being the beginning of my career in tech, because they believed in me. I walked in, and she goes, uh, the lady hiring me goes, hey, um, so we do a lot of employment stuff. And she's giving me kind of the, the potpourri that is in-house. And I'm like, how about patents? She goes, actually, we just got sued. But you don't have a tech degree. I'm like, that's OK. What can I do? What can I learn? Um, and so I, I got the tech bug, and, and I rolled with it. And now um, I, you know, I'm a trial lawyer. I love it. Um, I also advise companies in um, some transactional work, uh, you know, filing trademarks, uh, license agreements, software development. So um, I love what I do. I'm a very nerdy tech person. <laughs> so feel free to ask me um, anything related to intellectual property law, uh, maybe some development issues and how they relate to how you can get protection for your intellectual property. Um, and then as to something that I wish I had known, I think we are our own biggest enemy sometimes. A lot of times in these women in tech conferences, we talk about things that we want to change externally. We want to make sure that the wage gap is closed. We want to make sure that um, you know, there's equality in the workplace. But those are all important, but I think it starts with us. And so don't be um, your biggest obstacle. Look at your internal dialogue and believe in yourself. I think a lot of times I've held back in business meetings, um, I'll have an idea, and I will sit there and overanalyze it. Ah, maybe it's not so good. Maybe I shouldn't speak up. Um, I think the greatest power comes in believing your, in yourself, putting your idea out there, and then, you know, worst case scenario, someone's going to look at it and just move on to the next. Best case, someone sees your worth, which you all have. Um, they're going to see, you know, what your value add is, and you're going to feel confident. And when you show that confidence in the workplace, it's a lot easier for people to think, oh, you know, she knew what she was talking about. I'm going to give her this project, or I'm going to do this. So examine your internal dialogue and believe in yourself, because then people will start to believe in you, too. Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Maxine Gardner. I'm a Navy lieutenant commander, and I um, work at the Pentagon, and I'm I provide information to help decision makers 
um, make decisions for Department of Defense and the Navy. I'm a logistician, but that does not mean that I don't delve in tech. I actually, um, with a lot of our defense acquisitions programs, we um, take a look at the technical evaluation in addition to how it's going to provide these capabilities to our national security, to be able to support our national security. Um, my background, my education, I'm STEM. I attended school at Georgia Tech. I studied engineering. I knew very early on that I had a passion for technology and science and math, and um, I pursued that probably from the time I was a child. Um, I uh, went to school because I got a Naval ROTC scholarship and have been in the Navy ever since. So um, I can answer any question about DOD acquisitions. Uh, I participated in a cost evaluation board where I collaborated with the um, science, scientists and engineers that were helping to identify what, what requirements we had and what we needed from offers. I, um, I also did some cost estimates on UAVs with the Navy Center for Cost Analysis. And um, so yeah, so anything DOD related, anything logistics related, anything about what happens you know, in that five-sided puzzle palace <laughs> in, DC, in the Northern Virginia area, and what it's, what it's like to be a woman in the military, I can answer those questions as well. I don't think I can answer any pay differential questions since the Navy and the military were all paid the same thing regardless of our gender. But um, yeah, I can answer those questions. I, um, I guess my piece of advice is ensure that you develop relationships with people above you and below you. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you establish who you can trust and who you can gain Absolutely. information from and who can help you along your path. Also, make sure that you're, you know, assisting those below you as well, because there are lots of there are lots of other people that, you know, you can help because of your experiences that you've gained as you move your way forward. And also, similar to what Gabby mentioned, don't be afraid to challenge the system. You know, people that people want to hear what your thoughts are. Do it tactfully, but yeah, but don't be afraid to challenge the norm, because because I feel like a lot of times we we're afraid to speak up and mention that we've identified a potential gap or a risk for something. And uh, people need to hear about it, so. Yeah, great. All right, so we're gonna, I asked each of the ladies to now just sort of give a quick sort of TED talk, if you will, on something that's just something that we can give information about in a couple minutes. And then we'll go into a question and answer so that we'll get into some of the substance of the tech that we love. Um, and then we'll go into question and answer. So if you have questions based on what we were just talking about with ourselves, please save them, ask them, and we will love to answer them. But we're going to talk a little tech. <laughs> <laughs> From a non-technologist. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of us. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, you got it. Um, before I just gonna add, just add one more thing on to, to what Maxine said, because I had met want to say that. You know, politics is not just in the White House and in Congress. Politics will be in every job that you're in. And so it's very important, I'm, I'm tying into what Maxine said, to know the politics, to figure out who supports you, who's coming after you, mm -hmm. and, and how to protect yourself. I never believe in going after anybody. That's not the way you want to move your career. But you have to know, you don't want to be blindsided. This is the bottom line. So that's, and then the other thing I would say is one model I have always had since I was a child was I choose when and where I enter and nobody else makes that choice for me. That's my decision. Okay, so what am I passionate about uh, in technology? I think that technology has the capacity to be a great equalizer. It has a great capacity to give opportunities to, to those who would not have opportunities. and. I, there, is, there are areas of this country, and again, it goes back to you know me growing up doing civil rights. Rural Mississippi is ignored. The delta of Mississippi is ignored. That is a part of the United States, okay? And it should not be ignored. And so that's one thing that I have been working, trying to get more 
broadband, higher speed broadbands. You can't just have little broadband, you know. You have to have bandwidth for people to build businesses and for people to learn and educate. And if I wanted to pick out one area that I really care about, it is having to bring broadband and high speed broadband uh, to, to that area. And I understand that there'll be other technologies that come from the mobile world. You know, if we can release more spectrum, then you can have more innovation. But, because no one's gonna lay a bunch of fiber, you know, in, in places that they don't see a rate of return. But I think that it is a travesty for this country to allow any area to be underserved like that. Um, I guess it goes without saying, but also if these are, if there are issues that we mentioned that you're interested in, feel free to come up and talk with us after about them. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit of what the topic was supposed to be, which is just sort of breaking down. For me, my um, the reason I didn't want to spend an hour talking about are you at risk is that I think there's so much miss. I mean, even that headline itself in cybersecurity is sort of a misnomer. Of course, to some extent, we're all at risk, right? We all know that. Um, but the individual level of like whether you've you know updated your iPhone is obviously a totally different level of analysis than what our country is looking at, and it's a different level of analysis than what an entity like a you know company or even a government agency is looking at. So I think a lot of what I tend to do in my job is in the cybersecurity element of it is to reorient people's understanding to the fact that, you know, at, from an enterprise level, it's a lot of risk management. You're deciding where to spend money and how, and hopefully you're doing it in a way that is efficient. But it goes from, you know, a company's concerns is mostly bounded by that company. A government has the unique concern to care about the entire landscape and wanting to keep systems running. And of course, the individual is concerned about their own systems and I guess those who are related. And we are seeing an unprecedented sort of set of questions that arise between who owns the problems when things go wrong. So with these big breaches, whether it's OPM or Anthem, and you're looking at things like healthcare and um, you know, money and other, and education, other uh, systems that are prone to being hacked, of course, it's not surprising in some sense. Those all contain information that is valuable. And by valuable, I mean it can either literally be sold on the black market or it can be used for other purposes. So to some extent, I think a lot of cybersecurity is just not being put off by the moniker and going into what the meat of it is, which is a set of decisions that you kind of, to some extent, you're thinking like a bad guy, where, where would people want to go? And to some extent, you're looking at the technology itself and thinking, so if they're housing vast data sets all in the same place, not encrypted, it's sort of a sitting duck, right? I mean, like these are not unknowable problems by any means. So um, I'm glad to you know, answer questions or to break down some elements of that. I think, to me, some of the questions I've looked at and one of the pieces of advice I would give to all of you is to write and um, speak about the things that you see in the world that are things you're noticing that are not lining up with what should be. Um, and one of the thing, the, some of the things that I have written about are like the ways that our constitutional rights are playing against each other. Um, so for instance, one of my articles was who's the witness to an internet crime. So we're looking at these you know institutions that were built to give us a sense of justice and validity and often with the internet we get kind of abstracted to a point where it's very hard to point to a person and that i think is a innately there's no simple answer but there is an innately like human element of unfairness to a lot of what's happening as a result of our you know reliance on technology at the same time our interconnected systems are there because they're useful and we love having our google maps and we find our way around and we sort of submit our information voluntarily because it's providing a lot of value in a lot of ways and we're getting relationships with each other and those are backed by relationships between companies and these are exciting and they're also sometimes playing at each other in in ways that we have not seen so um, I'm glad to answer questions about that and uh, for the 
I guess, record, I would encourage all of you to start writing and, and um, putting your voice out there. It's a way to, to boost up your own, um, I guess, resume, but I, to boost up your presence in the area that you think you want to be when you're sitting at a cocktail party and <laughs> telling someone what you do, you can say, I'm someone who does X and believe it when you start to sort of play in that space. So I feel really fortunate that I get to work with, um, I call them techies, but you have these innovators who will create this amazing invention or whatever it is, and it becomes their baby. Um, and they come to us as counsel to figure out, okay, it's mine now, how do I protect it? And how can I license it out? And what we're seeing a lot of now, um, and I think is gonna be a big part of the conversation for engineers, um, for in-house counsel, for CEOs, is what do we do uh, with software? And recently, the Supreme Court came down um, finding certain versions of software will not be patentable. Um, and it's, it's the Alice decision. You can find it online. And what's kind of had this trickle-down effect is um, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, who does grant out the patents, um, is making what they call Alice rejections. So if you go ahead and you've developed um, some sort of software, some sort of application, whatever it is, and you're submitting it to get patented, if you are implementing it on a general purpose computer, you're likely gonna get some sort of rejection. Um, and you know, this costs a lot of money. You're going back and forth with the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, we've had clients that you know, call us in a tizzy, asking, well, what are we supposed to do? This is the bread and butter of what we do. We're a software company. Um, so you know, we've spent a lot of time as counsel trying to figure out how can we get around this um, and how can we make this work? And so, and what I do, um, we look a lot to beyond the general purpose computer. So when you're developing, um, it's really important to marry the software component with a unique hardware component. And we've been advising clients um, along those lines. And you know, in the software industry, I mean, it's kind of an infrastructure that goes hand in hand with a lot of cybersecurity issues where we're building software that's hopefully going to protect data. Um, you want to keep that in mind as you're developing. We advise clients um, along those lines. And something else, you know, um, so that's my patent hat. Then you put on your uh, development hat. We've got fantastic IT folks who are doing the actual development. And a big change that we're seeing um, in the way that we develop our software is agile development. Is anyone familiar if you've heard of agile? And so I think from a tech perspective, it's fantastic. Agile, for those who don't know, um, you are creating tech in increments, essentially, um, and you keep developing it and you're making it better versus the old way of doing things where it was, here's what we're looking for, go. <laughs> um, and you know, from the tech perspective, it's great. From the legal perspective, you guys have given us a little heartburn. <laughs> we're trying to figure out um, how to not only protect the developers, but protect the companies. Um, so if anyone has questions about agile development, um, you know, licensing agreements, who owns the IP at what stage, I'd be happy to talk to anyone about that, or just general strategy. Um, I think we default, especially when you're new in the tech industry or you have a startup. I've had startups come to me and they ask, okay, I gotta get a patent, how much money is it? You know, and they kind of get nervous because you only have so much money when you're a startup. There are a lot of creative ways to protect your intellectual property. Um, you have to look at what your company's goals are, um, what your timeline is going to be in terms of funding, and there's a way to do it that will, you know, cover and protect this fantastic intellectual property that you've created, but still make it functional. So if you all have questions about that, I'm happy to discuss. So um, within DoD, one of the catchphrases or terms that has become pretty popular lately is innovation. There's been a lot of um, push towards using some of the the principles of innovation that industry has used within the Department of Defense. We're looking toward in-house, like towards people within the military to try to, um, we're, well, we're asking people to come up with creative solutions to some of the issues that we have. Um, in the past, DOD was probably pretty good about developing our own technology um, years ago, but since then we've kind of, we, ha we recognize that there's been the shift to go towards industry to provide us with the capabilities that we need. Um, now we're trying to tailor that back a little bit and probably grow some of that on our own, um, but also at the same time, um, our, our DOD acquisitions process is incredibly cumbersome, which is also probably why we've come back to try to identify some of these new thoughts and ideas within within the people within DOD. Um, a lot of that is probably due to the way that budgets are structured. And um, I don't know, I, it's an interesting conversation that we have because you see that 
we want innovation within our organization and we're looking toward we're looking outside to try to find ways to grow that and it's to people that aren't within the military and I guess we just kind of look towards everyone else to try to give us some guidance on that so um, as you start writing more, possibly look into how, how you foster this innovative thought, how you foster this innovative um, problem solving that happens within organizations, within startups, and within other, other companies that, that you may go towards working. So if anybody has any comments that they could probably share with me on how to foster innovation in organization or how to foster creative thought, creative problem solving, a lot of us are pretty good at problem solving um, within the military, but we really do look towards um, everybody else as well. It's a collaborative effort. <laughs> yeah, often you're looking within the system and you need yeah, someone so yeah. fresh. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, um, do you guys have questions? We will otherwise sort of cut some up, but questions? All right. I'll do one for you, Maxine. You've done deployments where you're gone for like a year at a time. Are there times when no matter how much you love what you do, it's just a job? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is. But I wouldn't be able to get through those incredibly long deployments without reminding myself that what I'm doing is honorable. Um, I. I'm, you, you've seen me at my worst. You've seen me when I've come home from a nine month deployment in the Middle East and I've just been, I don't, I have this bizarre behavior where I don't want to be alone, but I also don't want to be around a bunch of people because I've spent so much time on a very small ship um, <laughs> with 300 of my closest friends. So um, yes, it is, it is a job, but in order for me, to justify mentally and emotionally what I'm doing and the sacrifices that I'm making with not spending time with my friends and family, I have to, I have to tell myself that it's something more than a job. I'm not doing it for the money. I'm yeah. doing it for something else. You guys, questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Tiana Davis. I'm currently a video game design student here. Cool. So most of our, we're deeply rooted in computer science. So I have a question about how so I understand that, so this is how it works in my mind. If I'm going out to get investors for a game or a software that I'm creating, how much of that do they own outright? Or is there, should you talk splits in the beginning? So I'm not sure about, because in my mind, I'm, I own this, I created this. So I understand I have to give up a certain amount of equity. Right. But what is, should be the norm in that process. So that's tough. It's really, it depends on the industry. Um, the first piece of advice, I'm going to, I'm sorry to be so lawyerly, but please have a non-disclosure agreement when you, when you go in and that's you're, you know, and you're putting this out there because you'd be surprised how often a lot of the issues are, they stole my idea. Um, and you can have a pretty standard NDA um, and it'll really protect you. In terms of equity, um, the question is, you know, when you're speaking to these investors, are they just backing the project? Are they backing your company? What's the nature of the relationship usually? There is no nature right now. No, but if, if, if you wanted to, though. I think, I'm not sure if I would want them to back the company because I would want to keep a certain amount of control. And I understand, I feel like that would make me an employee, how, how most of my partnership. Right. But where I would maintain creative control and I would lose the vision. Right. So the sad reality um, is that in those situations, oftentimes, um, if it's a big investor or perhaps a company that wants to take you on with your idea, they will usually have you, um, you know, basically sign off your intellectual property rights, um, you know, as an inventor on that particular piece. Um, I, it really does depend. If you're doing something more on the small side where you have an investor, you can negotiate, they can become, I mean, really have a partnership um, with that investor. I've actually, I was helping one of my friends, the, the creative and the tech joined, and they decided, you know what, we'll give you a partnership, you have this many shares, we maintain creative control. So they were still going to get a cut of what was coming in. Um, but when you're, let's say, going to like an EA Sports or something that, you know, it's a big company and you want to pitch your, your video game idea, 
they have an infrastructure in place that's probably going to, yeah, suck up those IP rights. And it's very difficult to have that um, ability to negotiate when you're dealing with a much bigger investor or a bigger company. Okay. Another question. So in terms of when you're dealing with situations like this, like app development, and all of you are working in this group, and so somebody, like in terms of what we're saying with Facebook, mm -hmm. so many other apps, how do you protect it? So should you tell, like, your partner, should you just already have, like, those contracts in place, like, hey, I know we're starting, we're just starting, and our app is really shabby right now. Mm -hmm. We have potential to be greater. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be the splits from the beginning. Right. And if they can't agree to that, I think the best advice I could give you would be joint development agreements mm -hmm. are essential. And so, you know, if you have that in writing, it could be something very simple. That's enforceable. You want to make sure it's jointly developed in terms of the copyright. Um, when you deal with video games, it gets complicated. Copyright, um, as well as any potential patent applications, you want to be listed if, if it does have some utility. Um, you want to be listed as an inventor on that. So I would say a joint development um, agreement with your co-developers. At that stage, I don't. You know, you're probably able to leverage. Hey, you know, this could be something big. We all should get credit for this um, because you'll see people like the Facebook example is great. You'll see people will turn on what once were their best buddies mm -hmm. when money gets involved. Um, so I would say, you know, you can get legal counsel on that and, yeah, joint development agreements essential on those kinds of projects. All right. Any others? Yes. But you can come talk to me. I'm yeah, come to do. Yeah, please do. Please come talk to me. For sure. Yeah. Hi, Tracy Mainly, Clever, and I'm a private law firm. So have any of you been uh, involved with on a team that was um, – Working on a breach of your employment, uh, of your employer, like cybersecurity breach. Like, were you, were any of you part of the response team when that happened? So I'm just kind of curious about the steps involved when a breach occurs, um, how that's handled. So I have some insight from the government side, which is that when a company comes to the government for help, they're usually coming to US CERT, which is housed in NKIC, where I work. Um, so as a first responder um, element, I have some visibility. And certainly, um, companies are often warring with themselves how much to disclose and how quickly to get help. And um, there are a lot of unique circumstances that are sometimes managed well and sometimes managed less well because companies have concerns about their own stock and and about the data itself. They often sort of mess up the scene by um, not calling right away. Um, but what's it, was, do you have a specific question about just? Um, I guess just for my own you know, personal, what, the things that I want to get into, I guess it's just mm -hmm. the steps involved of how you handle a breach um, I was just yeah. curious if anybody had experience of the, the steps that you walk through and, and, and things like that. Because I think the the education go, you know, behind getting yourself protected, you know, I, I think I have a handle on that. But I guess I'm now curious about the reaction side, like what, what things are put into place, you know, wh like what happens yeah. you know, technologically wise and policy wise. I think, so your last sentence really hits on it, but basically there are a lot of different elements that should come into play and sometimes are done well and sometimes are not. There's usually a project manager who kind of takes the lead, but there's an element of this that's stop the bleeding, right? There's an element that is maybe you need to buy new tech to um, like make your systems less vulnerable. Often there's a human element to it. Um, often there's a vendor element to it. So it depends on the breach, but it's basically okay, handled. So is, is there like a standard checklist or does it depend on industry and, and company? So there's a NIST cybersecurity framework that came out and that I guess is the closest that we have to a checklist just for checking to see whether you're sort of, it's not compliance but and it's deliberately not compliance, but to see whether you're sort of stacking up. Um, as far as mm -hmm. post breach a checklist, I'm sure that companies have them internally or are trying to develop them, but there is no one standard. The US government has not put out one standard, but I know that you know, US CERT goes through a checklist of like, when did we go on site? What are our remedial actions? Or is it possible that this could go further? Is it possible that it could recur? You know, and we're trying to get better at lessons learned in general. Um, you know, but there's there are a lot of different elements here, even in the government space. You've got law enforcement trying to catch the bad guy. You've got 
now FTC potentially holding you liable for not having standards that are high enough in the first place. And you've got us, DHS, trying to like get your systems running and, and keep, mostly we don't care about any one company, we care about infrastructure writ large, right? So we're trying to keep lights on. So it just depends on um, the industry, yeah. Okay. SD 800 61 is the government standard. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, a popular phrase that I keep seeing is, um, it's not, a, I'm paraphrasing, it's not a question of whether or not you'll be breached, it's when. Yeah, yeah, that's a common one, especially among people whose business is clean up, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's probably, I mean, it seems fair. I think it seems fair. It depends on, but like definitions of breach, this is like definitions of cyber attack where you've got like low level botnets happening all the time. So when you see numbers, the, they're not necessarily useful until you know what the context is and, and how real the damage is. Well, I thought it was interesting uh, when I learned that the, tar the big target for each that was yeah. in the news, mm -hmm. it was because their HVAC HVAC. vendor yeah. was insecure, mm -hmm. and that's how all that, that right. happened. Right. We're starting to get a little better about recognizing vendor and supply chain and all those things because obviously even Keypoint, like the government side, has seen that happen for sure. We're, and when, by SA starting to get better, I mean, I think we're recognizing it. I don't know that it has been fixed. It's certainly something that people in an organization should be pointing to as an area that is often neglected. Yeah. Since you have a variety of expertise in, in military and government in particular, and law, which is, isn't something always that we hear from a lot, I'm curious, do you think that, I mean, what kinds of breaches and incidents does the government worry about business not protecting against, well or not? Mm -hmm. Or are they all, it's just the scale of that? What kinds? What kinds of breaches are they worried about? Do you have thoughts, Deborah? Well, no, I just actually, I was just remembering, I think it was last Sunday in the New York Times, the big article where we've moved to a whole, the negotiations between China and the United States on cybersecurity, right. and it's like the new Cold War. Right. Mm -hmm. And what qualifies, like for example, um, the, the breach of uh, the uh, Office of Personnel Management with what, 21 million files being taken, um, the question was, you know, the Chinese sort of took the position, they, they have not admitted that they took the files, but it's, they say, well, the United States does the same thing, and this is just intelligence gathering. And intelligence gathering is legitimate. So, if so, how do we define intelligence gathering versus basically a cyber nuclear so, attack on your your infrastructure? Maxine, go. Deborah, um, so I want to before I say anything, I want to say that this, these are not the opinions of my boss, or my boss's <laughs> boss, or my boss's 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 boss. Um, I so speaking of the OPM data breach, they're collecting intel. I I think. Um, I'm sure there are tons of conspiracy theories, but but they're collecting intel because I think they want to uh, identify the assets. You're yeah, whoever whoever's collecting information on government employees, mm -hmm. they're probably trying to identify assets, mm -hmm. and um, it probably I mean I'm sure it extends beyond a lot of the things that we we assume. So in the military and the government, you know DoD, a lot of times we we consider counter. So we look at these technologies, but we don't fully identify all the risks. And there are a lot of counters that, that we haven't really fully identified and attempted to mitigate. So I mean, I, it's, this personal information, yeah, they, they're collecting intel on, on the people to identify where they are, where they live, who they are, what they're doing, um, whether or not they're collecting intel. But I also think that it, it, it's a little deeper rooted. So I think we're doing a roundabout way of answering your question, which is that yeah. I think the breaches that we pay attention to are the ones that, first of all, financial sector, the ones that like immediately cost us, often literally. Mm -hmm. But often we don't, and, and economic espionage is something that companies are constantly concerned about because they literally pay a price. But we often are not connecting the dots between industries or between companies <laughs> to say, well, we're seeing patterns, or we could be seeing them if we were taking a top-down view of patterns and, frankly, of um, sort of uh, 
compromises, but in like the old fashioned sense of being compromised. Um, where we are, we may have very good views of small pockets of things, but we're not, um, it comes back to the vendors even, we're not having a interconnected defense when we have very interconnected systems. So I think our concerns with breaches, my view is that our concerns should be you know, focused on, on getting, getting better able to connect those dots. Um, and that is something that I think is partially due to the fact that DHS until recently has not had much of a confidence to be that presence and they are likely the ones that should be doing it as a civilian um, sort of hub and not the law enforcement hub. And they have really only come into their own in the last couple of years and they are starting to do that but they are, the capability is still growing along with the authority and it's, it ought to be more mature. But I think, let me just add this, yeah. it's not my area of expertise, but I think <clears throat> on a macro level, we're now moving, you know, b before you used to have nuclear test ban treaties between companies. Now we're talking about cybersecurity agreements between countries, and we're trying to, we're on uncharted territory of defining what's a weapon that you can legitimately use, like intelligence gathering, and what's, uh-uh, this is breaching, like, okay, you can't, China, you're mad at the United States. We will not let you hack into our banking system and shut down our banking systems. But it's a, it's a question of, I don't know where they're going to draw the lines. I mean, like they, they signed this treaty, and um, my reaction was, well, and so what does it mean? Yeah. yeah. Right. I think that's a lot of people's reactions. Yeah. Yeah. So we hear a lot, I'm sorry, Latoya State and Maryland side were talking about this. this cool. <laughs> we, we, we hear a lot about the federal government and sort of large corporation cyber attacks. But you have, you have a lot of women who are starting their own companies, who are acting on social media. What should we be paying attention to on a more personal level um, that may be a threat or, or could impact the people we want to do business with mm -hmm. or you know, our, our social network? So, and how do we sort of mitigate those things? Deborah runs her own small business. Do you have thoughts? Well, since being bureau chief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, but, you know, I am, I'm not a real social media active person. And part of that is because I don't really, outside of my business, I, I post things that relate to me as a professional. I don't post a lot of things that relate to me personally because I don't want someone to be able to so easily steal my identity that they've learned all this stuff, my niece's names and my nephew's names and all these other things that make it super personal. So I'm, I'm just gonna inject that that's, that would be advice piece number one. Is <laughs> Not, uh, not necessarily just for stealing identity, but also just in general. I know that you tell your you know, 17 year old niece not to post stuff, but the same is true for you. When someone Googles you and they're like, should we invite her to, you know, should we pay her $5,000 to speak at this right. symposium? And the last thing you posted was about how like pumpkin pie is your favorite. It, just seems, <laughs> it just seems silly. I mean, like I think it, to the extent that you can silo your professional life, it doesn't mean that you can't interact with friends on social media, but you should have a professional presence right. that speaks to the stuff you know about yes. and and keep that up. Okay. And that's what I do. So I'm very cautious. I mean, I get, and I'm very cautious about what I accept. And on my LinkedIn, you know, who, I mean, every, there's, there's one theory that you should accept everybody who asks. I'm like, eh, I don't know. If I don't know you, I'm, and if I, I I'm, I'm just afraid, I check out who I want to be linked to because that's a reflection on who I am. Um, and the same thing with Facebook. I, I keep my page private, and you know I'm very cautious about who I admit. And of course, I have various encryptions on the on my files and things that I use at home. Mm -hmm. I do have, you know, but you know I'm I'm, I, I'm always scared about whether that those encryptions are working. But I do if I'm working on like I do some work for Wall Street analysts, and their stuff is very very private. And so if, if I'm writing an email or if I'm writing something that's that's going to go for them. I make certain that I'm saving it in a way that's encrypted so that if I lose my laptop, somebody doesn't pick it up and they right. can read what I've written. I'd play worst case scenario with yourself every now and then. Like if I lost my phone, would it be just a matter of buying a new one, which sucks but is not a compromise, or would it be something deeper? 
those are just like rules of thumb that for myself I think that um, you develop your own you know set of MO and I think that your posture including like if you're running a wedding planning business you're gonna want to be a lot more forthcoming on social media than if you're running an encryption software business right. you know it just depends on what your sort of presence should look like but I would say as rules of best practice I would certainly just be um, I'd wait 24 hours before you just make a decision if you're wondering whether or not you should be posting something wait 24 hours to decide those kinds of like just gut gut checks and certainly asking your techie friends yeah, is I, always a good I would just add on that yeah please do attach all your social media accounts to a complete and utter garbage email account that has no contacts and sends out no emails because then there's nothing to hack how many times have all of us got like some weird email right. from mm -hmm. someone and you're yeah. like, oh, my Facebook account was, you know, so attach yeah. something that has nothing. And I attach mine to a Yahoo account that I, mm -hmm. if That's on occasion an email goes out of it, right. I delete the contacts. There's nothing in that email for anyone to attack. So to add on to that, I mean, in terms of impact, you know, if you really want to reach out, think about the audience you wish to reach and what medium they are most active on. I think, you know, we have so much social media in our arsenal. Be effective, right? Um, and, and tailor your messaging in that way. I, it's, you know, there's great apps like Hootsuite that you can use and you can connect all your social media, but sometimes you're Jeez. most effective if, let's say, you know, in certain industries, Twitter's big. Some people love Tumblr. I mean, it really just depends on, you know, what your business is in and how you what you want to connect with them on that level. It's kind of a nonverbal way of connecting by, by communicating to them in the way that they're used to receiving information. So I think being mindful about that has a bigger impact. Yeah. So, so for me, it's a little different. I'm not allowed to post photos of myself in uniform because I don't want ISIL to find me. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that, that was actually something that came out. They mm -hmm. told us to stop posting ourselves in uniform so that we can't be identified as military members. Um, but I, was the question for you, was your question also involving how you protect your, your business from being attacked? It's, it's the business, and it goes back to who's right. responsible during that breach. Right. And, and dealing with the third party right. suppliers. Right, right. If, if any of us have I, a client that we're working with and we're breached, right. or our client is breached, right. it comes back to us. So, okay, so I have a little bit of, I, I'm on a special task force in addition to what I really do. And um, right now, what it's about is our husbanding, our Navy ship husbanding every time we pull into port. We're, we're working on our contracts for that and identifying who our vendors are going to be. The federal government, especially in the military, the Navy, we have clauses that we require our vendors to have that that like basically say you will ensure these layers of defense are in your cyber mm -hmm. or within your infrastructure for that. Um, so you could you could possibly have a clause like that within your contract. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of some other things. The opportunity for us to be able to take a look at what their systems are, and also another thing is we're trying to identify where these vendors who owns these companies what countries are owning mm -hmm. own these companies um, and how how intel could be gathered through third party means mm -hmm. from like dod intel or department of navy intel through our vendors and we consider that to be like the phrase that we were using is a soft underbelly of logistics because now that we're going to more electronic forms of payment and electronic contracting, we need our vendors to be able to have an access, a certain type of access into our systems to be able to, to bill us. And so we need to make sure that we're protecting ourselves. So that could be something that you take a look at for your, your business. And to build off of that, I think, I mean, making sure that, you know, there's an indemnification clause, oh, making sorry. sure that, I mean, we've even had clients who it'll be very clear. You want to put in step by step. When this happens, we expect a notification in writing by this amount of time, because then you have to, you know, somehow notify the people who have been subject to this breach. So I think the clearer your agreement is, um, you can hold people accountable in moving forward and, and making sure that things are covered. Cool. All right, one last question. Anyone? If not, I'll do it. All right. So my question is for you, Deborah. Do you think that, um, or I guess for any of us really, but do you think that the sort of the promise of tech to be the alternative or to like give voice to margins has lived up to that? Well, I think that, you know, before technology, <laughs> 
the voice was the newspaper and more traditional means, uh, there was less voice. And yeah, by far, I mean, you look at how people are innovating on the internet and the things that they're doing on their own, absolutely. Um, I guess at, when I was working, you know, at the, at the FCC, we were all concerned about the promise of technology, and we really hadn't focused on the danger side of technology. Um, because we were just so interesting in making certain that this got out and got done. But I definitely think that we see more voices, and um, it's so liberating uh, because, you know, before, you know, people had, believe it or not, encyclopedias in their home, you had to pull a book off the shelf, you know. And now, you know, you just say, Siri, what is? You know? <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled. I would have never imagined that, you know, I'd be having, you know, Siri, Siri told me how to get here to the University of Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely, and I, and I think I think there's a lot more to come, because I think, and I think a lot more to come is actually going to be coming from the wireless technology. So I really think that that's the real next space, is is wireless. And you'll, if you follow the FCC at all, you'll see that the FCC is very much focusing on um, making more spectrum. Everybody knows what spectrum is, right? Okay, of course you do, you're all tech people. Making more spectrum available so that you can, because innovation is really gonna happen in the wireless world, and when it happens in the wireless world, then you have less restrictions. I worry less about uh, Mississippi if you, can, if, you can get, if you can get access through wireless. You can have, everybody can buy a smartphone. You know, you don't have to worry about them digging up the ground. And so I think, yeah, there's a lot more to come. Uh, I also think that um, it brings the world much, much closer together. I mean, it just really brings us. I, I can't tell you how many phone calls that I got when Time Warner and Comcast were proposing to merge. Okay, now I, I was very happy because you know I would make money, but um, I would wake up to phone calls from London, Australia. I mean, from around the world that were interested in what's the FCC going to do with this. And so we are still. The United States really still is in the forefront of what's going on in, in technology in terms of the policies that are developed. And so I, I, only, I only see good things coming. All right, I think we should we cut? One more question, and then we probably need to, so everyone has a chance to take a bathroom break and yeah. those good things before the next session. That's fine. I think let's buy everyone some time back. Okay. All right, thanks guys. Thank you all. Thank you.